How you guys doing today? It's Anthony Ganji. Welcome to another episode of Tear Talk. Guys, we have a very good discussion coming our way today. We're going to talk about 10 things that will get you fired as a correctional officer. I don't know if this is all, an all-inclusive list, uh, but it definitely gives you an idea of some of the things that we look for in management uh, that really does have concerns for us, especially in regards to liability. Can this person still be trusted to do the job effectively. It's going to be a great dialogue today. My partner today will be Russ Hamilton. But before we go into the discussion, let me go over what I have on the market. Guys, Inmate Manipulation Decoded. If you haven't gotten a chance to read this book, I highly recommend it. It's used for training all across the country. It's available on Amazon. And basically, if you want to understand the games that inmates play, this is a good book to have. We also have How to Succeed in Corrections. This book is available through Blue 360 Media. Link to this is in the description. Now, this just got tips and advice, everything from leadership to the tactical, and it just covers a lot of good information. And it's not just me that provides the tips and advice, but I have also other people from the profession who also participated in this book. So again, great book. And this book just came out. Tips for new correctional officers and their supervisors. Same company, Blue 360 Media. Link to this is also in the description. This book is, again, just tips. A little bit smaller than the last book, but it's a great addition to the other two. So, guys, if you get a chance, please get all three. I'm telling you something. If you guys get a chance to read all three, embrace the knowledge, kind of just maybe even discuss some of these topics with people at work, it just gives you just such a good advantage in this profession. And I'm currently working on a leadership book few days behind, but I'm making it happen. And hopefully that will be done and completed and sent out to you guys sometime next year. And that book will also complement what's already out there. I'm trying not to repeat the same topics, which makes it harder. But with that said, let's get our show on the road. What's up, Russ? Hey there, Anthony. How's it going, sir? Good. Hey, Russ, you mind introducing yourself to our audience? So yeah, my name is Russ Hamilton. I'm a former and retired uh, sergeant from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Um, I've also done time as a senior juvenile correctional officer. Um, I now work for a private company where we do re-entry and rehabilitation work um, for a local county jail and a local probation department. And I am also the founder of Keepers of Chaos, um, which is a Facebook group where we cater to the needs of corrections professionals through, you know, training, advice, mentorship, and all of those good things. And, and, and Russ, how, housekeeper of chaos going right now? Uh, it's going great. Um, we're right uh, close to, I should have checked it today. I think we might be at 6,000 members. I don't know. I think that uh, Facebook has been uh, playing its little tricks as it often does with uh, law enforcement concerns. Uh, but yeah, we're right at the 6,000 mark and, uh, you know, growing by leaps and bounds, I still believe. And then um, on top of that, I also have, uh, you know, my uh, new sub stack, well, relatively new the past six months or so, uh, which is uh, dangerrusshamilton.substack.com. And, uh, you know, I try and throw out at least, you know, one good article or video per week. Um, for all the people that, you know, want to subscribe to that and it's free. Yeah. And by the way, guys, it's great because you also get the notification in the email and you can kind of always go back to it. it doesn't get lost in the Facebook feeds. You can get the whole sub stack in your email as well. So I love that. And uh, eventually we'll get Russ to start committing that to a book himself. Uh, we got to get I, there one day. It's it's slowly conglomerating, but, you know, I have a, a lot of irons in the fire right now. Yeah. So, all right. So, Russ, the topic here, I think these 10 things will get you fired. I think the reason why it's a good idea to have this topic is I think there's still a lot of misunderstandings in uh, what, what can cause someone to be fired. Sadly, if someone does do something that they shouldn't do, which is which could lead to their termination, the way it gets translated to their support staff tends to be a very uh, selective tale. And then when administration has to make the move to remove the person, a lot of people judge administration based on what this selective tale was, as opposed to what's 
really occurred. So I think in order for us to kind of maybe, you know, provide some clarity, me and Russ came up with 10 things that will definitely get you fired in corrections. Now, granted, um, some of this is general, but uh, we'll give you some specifics. But ultimately, the application of the knowledge here is really going to have to be on you because even though we may, uh, the removal offenses can fall into these type of categories, there's just so many specifics that can fall into these different types of categories. And, and for me, I just want to start this dialogue before we go into any of the categories to let people know that before we remove somebody, we look for two things. Uh, can the person still be trusted or can they still have the perspective of being trusted? So that's an integrity issue. And then we also look at competency. You know, are they able to do the job? Is there something that we could do more to help them do the job? Or is that a point where we've exhausted it and now uh, their failure could be more of a liability because some people, they just may not be able to do the job. Those are th two things I look at. Uh, Russ, would you like to add on anything that you would look at for me? Integrity and competency are the two main things, but maybe you have something. Um, yeah, you know, we always want to, you know, look at the integrity and the, and the competency, but you know, this is, this is what I would say to, to each and every, you know, officer, sergeant, um, you know, captain, lieutenant, whoever's out there on the line is, is that um, in order, if you really want to, you know, avoid those things that can get you fired, you know, you just have to have um, a really good structure of what you're operating under with regards to what your philosophy is. You need to have your sights on your proper North Star, something that always guides you in the right direction. If you're locked on to that and you have, you know, all your values in line, um, you're not going to make those mistakes because you do have that integrity already. It's those wayward ships that just kind of, you know, drift here and there and they're affected by bad management, bad peers, bad inmates. If you can imagine that, that's where people start to get into trouble. So these are things to avoid. But there's also, conversely, we should do this in, a, in another uh, topic, is things you should seek to achieve in your person and in your character and in your professional self. Well, maybe we have a topic for next week. And guys, I want to I also mention something, because a lot of times when someone gets in trouble, people like to compare. Like, well, Russ didn't get in trouble for not doing a count. Why should Ganji uh, get in trouble? Remember, guys, all of these things here are also very dependent on the consequences of what happened. Let's not forget <laughs> that consequences matter. So sometimes we get lucky and we could get a teachable moment because there were no major consequences. But if there's a major consequence, we could be removed from a teachable moment. So remember guys, consequences matter. Consequences matter. All right. And that's kind of, believe it or not, when I say consequences matter, that's kind of what moves things from uh, administrative concerns to criminal. And once you start moving into that direction, uh, administratively, we lose a lot of the discretion and what it is that we may want to employ, which could be a teachable moment. But once it goes beyond policy and it enters into something criminal, there really is going to be very limited administrative discretion that we're able to, to have. Okay, so... Let's go with the the little known, uh, well, the, the little, what am I trying to say here? The ones that aren't as severe, but through patterns, uh, it, it, it starts to question your ability to be reliable. So one of the things that we have are patterns of negative behavior. So granted, corrections, uh, I would like to think that we're ran on progressive discipline, which basically means we try to teach people first by giving them certain le letters of construction, uh, constructive letters, letters of counsel, whatever it is. Uh, and then if they just fail to meet, those letters wind up becoming the fact that, that, okay, well, we just documented our efforts to help this individual. They're just not meeting the needs. They have been notified. And now we start looking for disciplinary action, like three days, five days, you know, the stuff that really starts to note that this person's going downhill. One of these things I would say could be time and attendance. Time and attendance may not be something that, you know, will get you fired right away, 
But if you keep on developing a pattern and it shows that you're not reliable for coming in, eventually we go from it letting you know, hey, Rush, you know, you, you, you called out five days uh, last week and just letting you know, uh, you, you, it's starting to look like you're abusing your sick time. So just to give you the heads up, you know, try, uh, you know, to slow down on that. Oh, you know, next, next week, Russ keeps on calling out again. Okay, now, Russ, I'm going to give you an official written reprimand. I tried talking to you before. You're not listening. And then we start going into the progressive disciplines and ultimately a removal. That would be one case where patterns of negative behavior, even though initially that behavior, they're still, you're not going to get removed for it at first. But if you keep on doing it and we make the efforts to counsel you and then ultimately discipline you and it's still not working, uh, that's going to wind up leading to your removal. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Patterns of negative behavior that may not be as severe in the moment, but because you just keep on doing it and you're not taking the lessons learned and you're not listening to the discipline side, now you're pushing to the fact that we are looking at removing you. Uh, yeah, one clarifying thing here is, is you know, if we just attached, uh, you know, repetitive to the front of this, repetitive patterns of negative behavior, um, I think, you know, most everyone has some sort of negative uh, behavior at some point in their career. Um, but these are the ones that, you know, are, you know, uh, you know, pernicious that keep happening over and over again. Um, you know, you have to be able to go in there and function um, as a competent correctional officer under all kinds of conditions. And if your supervisor is, you know, pointing for you to go do something and you can't accomplish that mission, um, you can't get in there, you can't engage, you're refusing to engage, or you're just not giving it your all, whether that's, you know, uh, searches or sorting out a problem on the yard or uh, dealing with violent individuals. And uh, none of these things are coming to fruition over and over again. That's a, you know, repetitive pattern of negative behavior that negatively impacts safety and security. And so when we start impacting that safety and security facet of what's going on, that's kind of, uh, you know, going to be the end of you at some point. Uh, these are the kind of things that you can get away with for a while, but you can't get away with them forever. Yeah, Russ, you made a good point on something, too. Uh, attitude. Uh, could be a concern where I may be a supervisor. I got an employee that has just a negative attitude and maybe I'll try to deal with it. You never know. But if there's ever a concern where I need something done and it's important, that attitude now, based on the consequences of, of me uh, uh, probably now having to get somebody else to do it in the urgency of the moment can wind up leading to a major discipline. I have seen people that they're just hard to work with they seem to be rebellious. People will give them tons of opportunities. But at one point, it's like, you know what? I I'm done. I'm just going to go ahead and put this on paper. And then it starts to progressive discipline. But then you may get someone else who is maybe argumentative during one, one moment of their career. But the circumstances, the situation required immediate compliance. And now something has occurred. And now you have this person here who just picked the wrong time to have an attitude. Have you ever seen that, Russ, where you got someone that it's like, oh, that person has an attitude all the time, but they never get in trouble. It's like, yeah, I get it. There, you know, we're probably something being progressive with that individual. But if there's an urgent moment right now, let's say Russ is, you know, needs a direct order in full compliance right now. And that person who's never really been a problem, all of a sudden has that bad moment that person can wind up being severely charged because it's based more on the situation uh, than it is going to be developing the person's attitude. Would you agree with that, Russ? Uh, yeah, you know, those things are, um, you know, however you want to look at them are the things that tend to, you know, pop up and say, hey, look at this situation here and look at it under a uh, magnifying glass. And it has a lot more attention, you know, riveted toward it. And then that's the point at which, you know, it becomes one of those things that, hey, under these particular circumstances, there was no chance to try and fix what was going on. Um, there's a lot of circumstances where, you know, people can be, you know, reasoned with and, you know, uh, be given the, the right training or the proper type of discipline and to make things right. But when we get to these big egregious circumstances, you know, or more severe um, you know, more, uh, 
I would even say, you know, life threatening types of incidents, um, there's uh, very little uh, wiggle room in those, if you will. Yeah, like I, I have seen in my career, like an insubordination go one way where, OK, Russ gives an order to me to do searches. I'm upset. It's like Russ or Sergeant, you always give me these orders and, you know, they're do doing nothing. And it's like, no, I want you to do the searches. No, I'm not doing those searches today. So Russ writes me up. And insubordination could have a range from a letter of counsel to a removal. So they may say, you know what, you know, wasn't that severe of an incident? We'll talk to him. He'll, he'll still get something on paper. Ganji will still get something on paper, but, you know, we're going to work with them. But then there could be a moment where Russ says, oh, there's a code. Ganji, go to that area and stop those two, uh, work on, on helping that officer stop those two inmates from fighting. I'm not doing that. That insubordination is totally something different. The situation now has become more relevant, and therefore, Ganji may not be looking at progressive discipline anymore. Ganji is looking at possible removal because the determination of the situation matters. Um, you know, and I, I like how we spelled that out because sometimes a lot of people believe that, well, Russ gave Ganji attitude yesterday, and and Russ didn't get nothing. You know, and now I give attitude today, and I get something, and it's like, well, look at the situation. Situation does matter. Um, Okay, so let's move on to negligence. Negligence, to me, uh, Russ made a good point before we were starting the show. Negligence is all-encompassing, all right? Negligence is just people that just, they know better. They know better. They know they're supposed to do more, so they're not even doing the bare minimum. They're, they're not doing their job. Now, granted, we talked about before negative patterns of behavior, if you continue to be negligent and not do your job, okay, you will be held responsible. But sometimes it only takes you to be negligent one time. And there could be a serious consequence that happens. And all of a sudden, based on that, you're removed and there is no forgiveness. Because it, it to me, as I mentioned before at the very beginning, it matters on who's interested in your actions. If there's a neg negligent action and nothing really happened out of it. It's just somehow they proved that you weren't doing what you were supposed to be doing. Okay, administratively, we may want to pick that up and decide discretionary what we want to do with it. But if there's a negligent action that could have prevented, let's say, an inmate escape, which Russ, Russ will talk into a little more, or a uh, an inmate death, well, that's going to get picked up by a prosecutor. So now we're looking at criminal stuff. So right off the bat, the administrative discretion Mm. We we it, it has to go a certain direction. Administration. I mean, yeah, we could still write them administratively, which we will. But at this point, this matter is becoming a lot more serious. So at that point, that's a lot. That's a higher level of of negligence. Uh, and again, that's based on the consequences of the situation. Uh, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Because I know there's a lot here that people may not understand. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, with negligence, um, you're right. You know, when we talk about that negligence, it can be um, a huge range because, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, different uh, modifiers, if you will, that, you know, get thrown in the mix with that. Uh, you know, whether or not, you know, that's, you know, willful negligence um, or something, you know, that's just equally as bad when we start talking about the standard of depraved indifference, um, for instance. And then, uh, you know, there might be, you know, a lesser category that just falls under, you know, not understanding, um, you know, not caring as much, thinking that um, that what you're doing is of a, you know, a minor or, or de minimis uh, nature. Uh, but there's a, a huge range there and so much can fall into that. And it can be um, it can be, you know, everything from, you know, hey, dummy, wake up and pay attention uh, to, uh, you know, uh, criminal charges. You know, and criminal charges, you know, that are uh, levying severe, severe, uh, you know, uh, sentences uh, for doing some uh, specific things, uh, especially with regards to, you know, when we talk about, you know, depraved indifference, when you can start falling into, you know, things that, you know, fall under the Eighth Amendment, like cruel and unusual punishment, et cetera. So you should be aware and you should be uh, caring about, you know, what the actions that you're taking and the orders that you're following are. Yeah. And, and negligence, negligence, uh, negligence behavior, complacent behaviors, whatnot. Sometimes um, there could be cultural concerns. So when you have someone that's negligent, 
in their actions, the whole facility will be under the spotlight because the first thing they'll look at is to see, is this a systematic concern? You got an officer that's new, not doing the tours. What about the supervisors? Were they torn that night? Were they checking the logbook? And it winds up being that it's going to get passed down. You're going to pass it down from above to the lieutenants, to the sergeants until we can finally hold somebody accountable. But I will say this, when there's negligence, especially let's say related to tours or escapes, that winds up being just a lot more than one person getting written up for that. I'll tell you that right now. You know, one person even being removed. It turns out to be just a whole shift where I've seen one officer not do their rounds and it turns out to not just get that officer in trouble, but it turns out to get every supervisor that had contact with that officer uh, in some level of trouble. Because again, it's just, if this person is not doing their tours, then the first thing I may look at is where's their supervisor? Where's their supervisor? Are they holding their people responsible? So uh, again, so negligence is key, but it really does determine on the consequences. But having said that, because the consequences are out of your control when it comes to being negligent, don't be fucking negligent. You know, if you decide not to tour one day and then you find out that an inmate didn't die, you should be wiping your brow and being lucky that an inmate didn't die. You know, so having said that, you know, this is really dependent on the circumstances um, in deciding what actions. But granted, negligence is negligence. You could also have someone from administration that say, hey, this person didn't do their tour. You know what? I'm going to look to remove them because I can't trust them, regardless of the consequences, because here's the other part of the liability. The, the administration has the discretion to do two things right now, Russ, and, and it does matter. One is, do I think this is a teachable moment? And can I lean on this as a teachable moment? So God forbid something happens and this person doesn't do their tour again. Can I bring up my effort to teach them as a way of correcting this liability? Or is this person just not getting it or just doesn't care that I know there's no consequences yet, but there could be. So at this point here, ah, I got to let them go because I can't make this into a teachable moment because ultimately our decision is going to be filtered on the trust that we have to hold people accountable to get the job done. Would you agree with that, Russ? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's absolutely one of the factors that you have to take into consideration. And, um, you know, all of these things, you got to remember that if something does happen down the line, um, the absence of those documents of that paper trail or the presence of them might weigh heavily um, with regards to, you know, the potential for, for liability. And so, you know, liability is one of those things that, um, you know, as a line officer, as a line sergeant, we want to understand um, that, you know, uh, administration takes that sometimes much more seriously than we do. But we should be the ones really invested in the process to try and mitigate all of those things. And I think that that's just a matter of, uh, you know, uh, more and better training and a better overall understanding of what it is that we seek to achieve inside the correctional field. Yeah. So as long as there's not a, like, if I teach the person and there's no lack of trust in the process, maybe it is a competency concern. I get it. But if I, if I'm trying to teach a person that I feel has lost that level of trust, lost that level of autonomy, then guess what? The teachable moment it's only going to be liability later on because if something does happen, uh, I could say, well, I try to teach them. They're saying, you try to teach this person after they did A, B, C, D, and E? Yep, not worth it. So, I mean, that's just good for people to know the the type of decision that we have to make and what way against us. I mean, if, if it's hard to say that you could treat everything fairly because it's the truth. You may not be able to treat everything fairly, but one of the things that we look at is, is this person, as I said, can they be taught? Can, I, but more importantly, can we trust them to be effective the next time? Um, and not everybody um, may not everybody may deserve that second chance. Sadly, uh, undue relationships with an inmate, which I believe, uh, I'm sorry, guys. I know inmates play games. I wrote a book on it. But when I'm talking about undue relationship with an inmate, um, usually you get someone who's coming in already that just has that mindset. So they really weren't meant for the position anyway, or you get relationships that were developed. I still feel they're very intentional efforts uh, both ways, whether it's more long-term or whether it's immediate. Uh, but having said that, once you start crossing lines 
into that inmate relationship, your loyalties have shifted. Uh, Russ, what's your thoughts on, uh, again, uh, even if it's an undue relationship, even in the most simplistic of fashions, because I have seen someone, let's say, give something to an inmate very small that they should not have. And maybe that's an error in judgment. I get it. An error in judgment doesn't mean it's an undue relationship. You still have to look at other things, you know, okay, well, he gave them this, but oh, they're with the person all the time. They're hanging out with that person all the time. I mean, do we have a developed relationship? So Russ, how do we separate what could be an error in judgment to what is an undue relationship with an inmate? Yeah, this is, you know, just the dividing line. You know, are we in there? Are we friends with that inmate? Um, are we friendly toward that inmate or are we cordial um, with that inmate? You know, and cordiality is fine. Um, when we start getting into those things, those types of exchanges where, you know, uh, that are more, you know, friend based, that's uh, that's really where the problem begins. And you've got to understand that no matter no matter who that inmate is, whether they are specifically um, trying to cultivate a relationship in which they can get over on you. And, uh, you know, that may not even be corruption. It just may be it just may be that part where you're less aware or a security breach happens that they're able to leverage or whether uh, that individual has developed that relationship and has uh, no real, um, you know, uh, you know, deep seated uh, things that they're trying to get over on you. That person still might be ordered by an STG to try and take advantage uh, of a situation like that. And so that's where, you know, we have to really define what our boundaries are going to be with the inmates. Um, everything from what you're going to discuss with them to how you're going to treat them um, to, uh, to, you know, everything else that encompasses what you do in the presence with and around inmates. And so, uh, you know, um, we, and we spent we've spent so much time addressing this. And uh, yet, you know, every every week or so on the news, we, you know, see a new um, relationship that an inmate has cultivated and ended up in absolute corruption. It's the other ones that um, that we don't see that go much less far, but still impact the safety and security that we have to worry about, too. But, you know, we have, you know, uh, inmate manipulation decoded out there and uh, people should be taking advantage of resources like that. And using them not just for their own sake, but to teach other people about that. Because I think, you know, that people think, well, I could never be, I could never be corrupted, you know, because I would never get involved with an inmate. Well, is that really true? I mean, could it be that uh, you're going to look the other way during a search? Could it be that you're going to give them that little, you know, item that means nothing? Well, guess what? They've just leveraged what they have over you. And so this is where uh, and, and, you know, this brings down the whole uh, the whole PREA aspect of things, too, because, you know, uh, you get a, uh, you know, a PREA investigation that substantiates something where you were out of pocket and you're going to be gone. That That's all there is to it. Yeah. And, and to be honest with you, that that actually should be uh, we might as well add that as a bonus one. Any uh, a PREA violation where you're found to be guilty of that. Pre a violation, which would include a sexual. Actually, to be honest, that may fall into the next category, which is violation of human rights. So that's a good idea, Russ, that we cross into that. I just want to mention something when it comes to undo. Uh, what undo relationships uh, with an inmate is obviously going to start superseding your professional judgment. Uh, relationships sometimes, not that it means to be, but they could be obligatory in nature. I mean, I, I'm not saying that, you know. Um, me and my wife have this reciprocal relationship where she does for me and I do for her. But having said that, if, you know, she's spending all day cleaning, I may say, hey, what would you like to go to a movie today? What movie would you like to choose or or whatever is a vice versa? Maybe she cleans the inside. I go clean the vehicles. I mean, relationships are, you know, they they're, you know, meant for the home world. No, not meant for the. Uh, not meant for the prison world. And I, and I do want to mention one other thing when it comes to this undue relationship. Um, they, I, I believe in my experience that we allow for these things to be developed. And then when we get cornered, we go into survival mode. And then we have a chance to make the right choice and we choose to focus on ourselves. And if you think about it, 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 it the behavior at the very end where you choose yourself over 
the facility because now you're concerned about the inmate turning you in. That's not the first moment you became selfish. The first moment you became selfish was when you initiated or when you got involved with this inmate. Now, granted, for me, if I see someone that makes an error in judgment, I will work with them. But if I see in context that their error in judgment is always around one in inmate, whether it's sexual, whether it's, uh, you know, whatever this relationship is that they're trying to build, because it doesn't always have to be sexual. You know, me and Russ are fanatics of the same sports team. We could just be buddies here. You know, the key is whatever that relationship is, is going to supersede that professional judgment. But if I look in the context that, hey, this wasn't a momentarily lapse in judgment. This guy is talking to this inmate all the time. You know, this guy is giving him food from the officer's dining room all the time. You know, it's the act of favoritism that now makes a greater context to this error of judgment. An error of judgment, okay, I get it. You made a bad slip. You gave the guy uh, some food from the ODR, which you shouldn't have given. But then when you look at the videos, you see that the person's constantly with the officer, hanging out with the officer. They're constantly chatting. Uh, this is no longer an error in judgment. This is a, a, a greater concern. This is now relationship driven. And again, depending on the consequences, for me, if I could see that there is a developed relationship that led to the error in judgment, um, I'm probably going to push for the automatic uh, removal and see where it goes. But if it's something simple where, yeah, the person made a mistake, he gave an inmate, which is a random inmate that he usually doesn't deal with all the time, an extra sugar packet or something foolish, whatever it is. All right, I'll, I'll just I'll just talk to him. You know, this is just an inmate that's random that try to play a game. Let's just talk to him and make it a teach a teachable moment. But even though some people may say, well, sugar packet guys, the smallest thing matters because it's a breach that leads to something bigger. So again, I like to look at the context to look to see if there uh, is something more developed when it comes to looking at these era of judgments. Um, Russ, this is one you speak on dearly, and there's a lot of things that are going to be covered in this, whether it's Priya, uh, use of force, stuff like that. Uh, but let's talk about violation of human rights, uh, what they're allowed, what they're not allowed, stuff like that. I mean, obviously, that's going to be a zero tolerance, correct? Um, yeah, when we start talking about, you know, violation of human rights, um, when it involves us, you know, it necessarily involves, you know, that other uh, corollary to this, which is, you know, under color of authority. And that is huge. I mean, that is going to um, almost certainly, um, you know, involve some type of violation of state law. And it's um, almost certainly as well going to involve a violation of federal law. So, you know, at the federal level, when we're talking about, you know, violation of human rights um, under color of authority, probably the least little tick that you can get on that is going to be a 10 year stint. Um, is that what you really want? You know, when we start talking about, you know, um, oppression of prisoners, um, when we start talking about, you know, uh, potential, you know, PREA violations, which even though, even though PREA doesn't define any actual crimes, um, if you get uh, hit on a, a PREA violation, it can lead to some of these other uh, things under, uh, you know, government uh, codes. And so uh, these are very, very serious issues. But that's also the reason why we have that bright, shining, you know, beacon of a, a North Star for us to look at and to guide our actions, which is our oath. You know, we have to be very serious about that. We don't get to pick whose rights we protect. We have to protect everybody's rights. And that is, you know, first and foremost, the public. We have to keep these guys behind bars. Um, the second one is, is you know, um, our own staff. We have to keep everybody safe there. And but there's um, nothing, um, you know, uh, lesser about, you know, making sure that we, uh, you know, protect the rights of these inmates. We may not like what the law says. We may not like what the law does. We may not like the effort that we have to put into that, but we don't get to pick you know, whose rights we protect and whose rights we don't. If you keep that in mind and you keep that as your northern star, as your set of guiding principles, you know, when we talk about things like, you know, being firm, fair and consistent, that's for us to keep us on track toward that north star. It's not about, you know, making sure that the inmates get what's due them. Right. We don't get to decide that. That's the that's the courts and everything else. So you have to be on point with this stuff. 
because we don't want to wander into these areas where we're talking about like, you know, Eighth Amendment violations and things like that with regards to, uh, uh, you know, with regards to cruel and unusual punishment and things of that nature. So stay on point, use that North Star principle and don't get caught up thinking that, you know, you're going to go in there and you're going to mete out some type of justice because that's just vigilanteism. That's just taking advantage and you run afoul of violating someone's civil rights and you could very well be looking at a 10 year bid. Hey, hey Rush, you made a good point that I want you, if you don't mind, can you revisit again? Um, a few good points, but the one in particular is when we're talking about human rights, there are those that violate or those that fail to protect it. And I think that's two different issues. And I think that should be uh, mentioned where, like, again, that if, if you, Russ, decide to beat up an inmate and I fail to get involved to uh, go ahead and protect that inmate, uh, I am going to be held liable for that because I failed to do my job uh, to protect that inmate from being assaulted, which in most cases could be just simply intervening. So is there a difference between the actual violation of a human right, which you could be held responsible for, and the actual protection of human rights, which you also could be held responsible for? Well, all, you know, all of those things tend to, uh, to always put us in where it is, you know, considered to be an actual violation. If I go out there and, uh, you know, I, uh, let it slip to the inmate population that, you know, such and such is a, is a snitch. And I put him back out there on that yard. Um, just because they are meeting out their own form of justice doesn't relieve me, me having the knowledge, responsibility, training and duty uh, to not to not only not do things like that, but to be proactive in stopping them. Um, yeah, it absolutely is a violation of the law. It's a violation of uh, the guy's civil rights. I don't get to just say, hey, because I managed to keep myself somewhat removed from that, that I'm OK. And um, if you view it like that sooner or later, you're going to put yourself into a bad situation. Um, you, you can't view it like that. We have a higher duty, whether we like it or not, um, to the inmate population. And, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that we're out there stopping everything all the time. But what it does mean is, is that we have to take that duty seriously and we have to execute our duties um, you know, in a way that, uh, you know, makes us into the professionals that we're supposed to be. Yeah, I, I like to think that when it comes to the actual, I love I love what Russ is saying, because ultimately it is a, a violation. But when you have those that are aggressive and take it away, obviously that's something that we have zero tolerance for. But another thing that we have zero tolerance for is negligence and protecting it. So again, we touched on negligence before. This also plays out, uh, you know better. And now you fail to protect that inmate's um, human rights. So that's just another area where you don't want to be negligent in because if they know you're there and they know you know better, uh, my ability to trust you to be effective uh, is, is going to be a concern. So, yeah, that, that's a good that, that's good. Hey, Russ, this is something that uh, I know you're adamant about you you uh preach this in all your shows and what we do. I mean, you try to get this thought out there, but Russ. This to me is automatic removal um, only because one, the, the potential for the greater consequence, but two, once you do it once, you can never earn the trust of your peers, management, inmates, whatever, ever again. And it's an act of cowardice. Russ, is that, that's a zero right. tolerance for you, right? Yeah. So, you know, um, let's just, you know, put this out there is that, um, is that operating inside a correctional facility is difficult and it is fraught with fear and trepidation every day. And I don't care, um, you know, whether that's a level one or a level four, you should have your head on a swivel all the time and you should uh, believe yourself to be capable of functioning in that. Uh, we come into these uh, situations which are, you know, fraught with, you know, uh, rapidly unfolding and uncertain circumstances. And we're expected to do something about it, you know. And uh, sometimes that means that we have to go in there and lead the charge. You know, sometimes we have to go in there and uh, and use force. And whatever it is, is we need to be able to respond. 
And uh, I've been in situations uh, a few different times, unfortunately, where I was left in the lurch, left to my own devices amongst uh, sometimes many, many, many inmates. And things could have gone bad. As a matter of fact, uh, me and uh, a partner of mine, uh, Kenny Gonzalez, we were in a situation where someone else actually went into a bathroom and locked themselves in there and did not come to our aid. And we weren't even aware of that at the time, but our lieutenant certainly was. And there's no there's no room for that. You have to put your ass on the line at that moment in time until we get to a point where every staff member can be safe. Um, we can't always, you know, just go in there and be thinking only about uh, the inmates, though. Sometimes inmates have to be left to their own devices for a little bit until we get enough backup to come in there and uh, measure things out. I know that's not a popular view, but we can't do anything, uh, you know, proactive in an emergent situation if we're constantly having to go in there and rescue uh, staff members because they're putting themselves on the line. Sometimes we have to come back. We have to regroup. We have to get the necessary, um, you know, equipment ready and then go in there and take that yard back. And I've been in that situation, you know, a, a lot of times and there's no room for this cowardice. You, if you can't go in there and be certain that you are going to, you know, give it your all, whatever that is, we don't need you out there because you're not being effective and you're just going and hiding somewhere. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never, I'll never forget. I was a seating officer, um, in this one particular dining hall, um, South dining at, at San Quentin. And I was going to try and get this piece of paper that I saw another inmate had handed to another one because I knew it had some, I knew it had some gang value to it. And there weren't even, you know, necessarily all that, all that many uh, inmates in there, but I just said, Hey, I want that paper. And I went to go, you know, turn them around and I looked over and my partner had actually gone out the gate and walked it and left me after seeing me in that position. And, and then it was just, you know, uh, thank goodness, thank goodness for some of my, uh, for some of my, you know, close buddies there that, you know, managed to, uh, you know, pull my ass out of the fire on that particular one. Uh, but you know, you can't just decide that you're going to be a coward. And that individual there, uh, came to work the next day, faked a heart attack and left and never came back. So. Wow. wow. I, I, I'll tell you something when it comes to cowardice uh obviously you don't want to put yourself you don't want to be so courageous and so impulsive uh that you wind up damaging or uh making the concern greater i mean like russ said there are certain times where maybe you running in immediately uh could cause a greater concern but uh, i remember someone telling me you know that um this job does require you to put your life at risk you know, it's just what the job demands and you're not going to be running into moments where someone's going to tell you you're a hundred percent free from risk. You know, it requires you to know something internally that I got to go in there. Or if I do go in there at this point, that's actually going to cause a greater concern. Uh, and that's kind of where those decisions are made. I I've seen people that, uh, do act, do, do what they got to do. But then there are moments when they, you know, have to wait for that response and it gets to them because they want to go in. You can see them wanting to go in, but they know if they go in, uh, they actually be, make it more of a liability. So sometimes it's good to have that controlled response, but sometimes your immediate help is needed. And that excuse that you were waiting for someone in the wings to come in and assist, it won't work, especially if it's immediately in front of you. And I'm not talking about inmate on inmate because that we could wait, um, you know, because we got to make sure we have a strategic response. We got to secure the area. There's a bunch of things in play. But when we have an attack on the people that are meant to assist, that are meant to solve the problem so we can be more effective, you know, that's where it's like, yeah, I got to go right in. And that has nothing to do with saying one less, uh, one life is less valued than the other. It's more of these are the people that control the chaos. So if we don't get to them right away and we don't help those individuals right away, we're not going to be in a position to control any chaos. 
Uh, so with that said, I think cowardice for me ultimately is an unforgivable offense because ultimately if I know that Russ ran away from a code one day and I got to work next to him and he's my partner, uh, I'm not going to be effective in my job. Plus our rapport is gone. I, I, I think to me, undue, an undue relationship with an inmate and cowardice, if I could put it in order, I would do cowardice first and then undue. If there was an order, even though I believe that they both could have the same main results, I just wanted to heighten the severity of what cowardice means uh, to me. I know one may mean, okay, I, I, I can't trust this guy because he's with it. I get it, but I can't trust this guy on a greater scale. Or I can't trust this woman on another scale. I mean, they literally are going to run away when I need them. You know, where, sad to say, if you have a corrupt officer, it doesn't mean they're going to guarantee run away from you. You know, and just... Cowardice to me is is something that I hold at a greater level, not negating or minimizing the other, but cowardice to me is, is an unforgivable uh, offense. Um, would you agree with that, Russ? Cowardice, if you had to choose one? I, just well, I, I agree. You know, I'm going to tell you something that, um, you know, the public doesn't often get to peek behind, uh, you know, that uh, that curtain, you know, that those iron and steel doors. Uh, with regards to what's going on in corrections. But, you know, uh, when you see the public's condemnation, and I only need to say, you know, two words to for everyone to lock in on this, uh, you know, Uvalde and Parkland, you know, um, I mean, it's it's obvious, you know, there's no there's no room for that out there in the real world. And there's no room for it, especially amongst ourselves, you know, uh, you know, behind the wire. I agree. I, I agree with that. I'm actually going to put that on Facebook real quick, see what people say. Maybe I'll have a couple of comments before we end the show. Um, Russ, this is important, and this is a lot different than uh, making amends to a report, but fraudulent acts or statement definitely relates to integrity, credibility. Uh, what's, your, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Uh, so, um, you know, in... When I was um, in, in CDCR, you know, um, there was, you know, an absolute line drawn at, you know, making a false statement, filing a false report um, and that kind of thing, which was, you know, automatic, you know, termination. Right. And so uh, these things, you know, are huge. Uh, the first thing I think of when I say, you know, fraudulent act and statement is, uh, you know, the problems that those uh, individuals had because they weren't doing their counts. Uh, when uh, Epstein uh, killed himself, Jeffrey Epstein. And so, you know, they had just gone ahead and, you know, just written everything apparently down in the logs and had not done any of those things. And they put themselves in the path of that train. Um, you know, there should have been an expectation on their part. Hey, what if something bad happens in here? And, uh, you know, we're just doing a paper tour. We're just doing a paper count or whatever it is. And you can't do that. You know, you have to like that piece of paper that you're filling out, no matter how small you might think it is, um, there better be some um, substantiation that you did, in fact, to do those things. And so uh, with regards to that, think about what it is that you do with that paperwork on a, on a day to day basis. You're vouching for something, you know, uh, just had uh, just had an, an incident at my last uh, adult institution uh regarding this and uh you know probably um one of the worst uh incidents um that i've ever um i won't say it's the, the worst ever but it had the potential to be um certainly one of the worst um things ever and you know it was all based on a count and an inmate getting out and getting access to a firearm and uh cdcr is very lucky that um in one respect that things went the way they did and very unlucky about uh the rest of the fallout that happened from that and uh the tragedy that happened with the that one officer i'm not going to get into more details than that but you know just the idea that hey i did a half ass count or i did the count and i didn't bother to you know actually make sure that that count was correct and um led to that you know that uh, link of you know unfortunate events that ends up with a catastrophic uh, incident so don't uh don't just you know paper whip things out 
Don't just decide that, hey, uh, whatever I write in pen is, is good enough. And that means that I did it because it doesn't. And, uh, I post a question up for cowardice and, uh, and uh, the undue relationship. I think for cowardice, because it's in the heat of the moment, uh, and that's where we need you to be there at that moment, no questions asked. I kind of hold that at greater value, but I'm curious to see what people say. For the fraudulent act or the statement, obviously there's that level of credibility that, as Russ mentioned, is totally wiped out. You write a report and it's totally uh, opposite of what happened. Because remember, you can add, things get discovered later on that you may have to add. That's fine, it happens. But when it starts to mess with the integrity of what you've written, uh, the trust factor is gone. And for people that are held in an authority position, like officers, uh, where your word matters, where what you write on a report has more weight than what an inmate writes, your credibility can't be questioned. It cannot be questioned because the moment it's questioned, I I always tell people an inmate's word and an officer's word are not equal. Just like a supervisor's word and an officer's word may not be equal. Anytime I put someone in a position of authority over another, I have to look at the person in authority with uh, higher accountability, but also a higher level sense of trust unless they violate it. And once it's violated, the question of them being in that authority becomes a problem. So remember that those that are in those higher level authorities, uh, you're given that higher level sense of credibility, but you can destroy it immediately the moment you go ahead and commit to a fraudulent act. Um, let We can run this one real quick. EED violations, guys. Uh, everything is a protected category right now. So you have to be very careful of the words you say. You know, even something as simple as bitch could affect the female gender. I mean, so you got to have a, you got to be very your choice of words matter nowadays more than it ever did before. And even if you guys are having heated moments where me and Russ are going into an argument and I slip and I say something, and you know, we're, we, we could both be held accountable or I could just be held accountable. I mean, but having said that, guys, it gets to a point here where if there is any, fa- if there's any violation of EED matter where they feel that you can't be trusted to do your job fairly and objectively, you will be removed in a heartbeat because that could also fall to some level of violation of human rights, if you if you will. But Russ, real quick, Russ, I mean, obviously nowadays, the way the culture is, uh, <laughs> EED-related violations, zero tolerance for it, right? Because we have to promote diversity and equality in the workplace. And once you start uh, violating EED, it breaks away from what it is that the department is trying to push out fairly, correct? Yeah. And, you know, um, you don't have to like this. I mean, I know I don't. I would rather work around, uh, you know, people that are as uh, thick skinned as I am, Um, you know, and it doesn't even have to. I mean, you you might be as thick skinned as the guy you're having an argument with. And now they've given the right to, you know, if any third party is offended or a fourth party or fifth party that hears about it, you know, on the news or whatever it is. Now, all of a sudden they have some kind of standing in the action. And so um, I think that um, I think that most um, facilities, most departments have gone way overboard and none of us like it, but we all got to deal with it. And so that's just that much more incentive uh, for each of you that, you know, um, view this thing. But I think the way that um, I do and, and I think the way that Anthony does promote, let's make some changes. You know, we don't have to be we don't have to be, you know, at the mercy of every uh, of every single little you know political viewpoint that you know wanders down into to our area and our domain you know there are ways there are ways to push back push back effectively and make corrections better so uh but know this that um that you know you could be held accountable for something stupid and so don't make stupid mistake don't make these um i guess i would call these unforced errors i mean it's obvious you know when you talk about something like cowardice, it's obvious, uh, you know, when you uh, when you talk about, you know, uh, making a huge mistake or, you know, filing that false piece of paperwork, it's a little less obvious when we wander into these areas. And so just, you know, be cautious and, uh, you know, be that consummate professional 
and uh, do what you have to do to make yourself professionally safe. Yeah, when I said that question already, for even though they both consequentially could have the same negative <laughs> outcome, who would you have less forgiveness for? An act of cowardice during an emergent situation or an, office, or an officer getting overly involved with an inmate? So the guy, Anthony, says, asking the hard questions this morning, officer getting involved with a convict would definitely be bad and should be punished severely. On the other hand, leaving me hanging while I'm getting hurt would be definitely um, be unforgivable, especially when I know I have your back. If it's 30 on you and I'm there, it'll be 30 on two. Um, and then there's uh, another person. Uh, actually, I can't get the comment. Now. They may have removed it. Um, but, yeah, so I thought that was an interesting question. Uh, so, okay. It is so, a hard question. It's a hard question. Yeah, but, but you, can I tell you something? The easy answer is they're both. I just want to see, you know, make it a little bit harder by saying you got to choose one. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, coming to work under the influence, um, uh, as for an officer, uh, usually there's a zero tolerance towards that. But because we've become a little bit softer in our tone, it really depends on when it's caught and what were the consequences uh, that occurred. Uh, because uh, obviously the department's aware that people do suffer from, um, you know, uh, addictions, you know, I guess I, I don't know how to sugarcoat this, uh, in relationship to discipline, but basically we know sometimes the job could also force people, uh, to break away from what's the right behavior to do. But having said that, I think there's also a knowledge of knowing that you don't feel right to do the job effectively and you're held accountable for the fact that you could be coming to work under the influence, which could affect your judgment, uh, which could affect your ability to protect your peers. I mean, there's a whole lot of things there that can take a problem in which you need help. And I'm going to sad to say, but could turn it into a problem where uh, your actions to do what is right and step up now have become selfish. I'm sorry to say, but it's true. If you're coming to work and you're not able to do the job, then you're putting my life at risk. You're putting Russ's life, you're putting everybody's life at risk. So at one point, yes, it's a problem where we all have to help you and we want to help you, but you have to admit to the vulnerability first that it's a problem. So I think sometimes it may be tougher to want to admit that, but I think in this profession, you, you got to, you have to, to some extent, because if you don't and you start coming to work with these demons still inside you, that's going to affect your ability to be effective in this job. And everybody is expecting you to be 100% uh, percent effective. Now, granted, if we catch it and there are no consequences, you know, nothing crazy, the department may work with you uh, in, in, in their efforts to make sure that you are uh, seeking help. And then in response, if you could showcase that you're seeking help, they may work with you on a more longer, longer term basis. But with that said, uh, coming to work under the influence as an officer, there's just so much liability connected to that, uh, that, that could, re that could result in an automatic removal, regardless of what you may be battling. Uh, what, what's your thoughts on that, Russ? Cause this is a tough one. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can think that, you know, a person that, you know, comes to, uh, work, you know, under the influence at that point, um, there's going to be a future point at which they're going to do it again in all likelihood. If they don't do it again, there's still um, probably a likelihood that they're going to be under the influence at some wrong point in probably the near future, uh, you know, behind the wheel of a car or whatever. But, um, you know, if we're going to have this person show up and then what are we going to do? We're going to give them uh, a gun and send them out on a on a um, on a transport or something. And then they have a wreck and or they or they use that gun. And uh, the next thing you know, someone is, you know, taking a blood sample because that's what happens um, if you use uh, lethal force. The one of the first things that they do is they send you off for that blood sample. So, um, you know, we have to we have to protect the public. We have to protect the inmates. Uh, we have to, uh, you know, shield from liability um, and. Uh, and, you know, in these cases, you're going to have someone with really impaired judgment out there operating in uh, in a situation that's inherently hazardous, which is, you know, within the correctional system. Um, if we wouldn't, you know, uh, put them behind the wheel and uh, send them on down the road, why would we, uh, you know, uh, give them a set of keys and tell them to, hey, you know, go conduct unlocks or whatever?
um, I would say that, you know, on the average, it's much more hazardous out there on your average correctional yard than the highway. Um, but we're willing to do that. No, absolutely not. We need to, uh, we need to make sure that, um, people, first of all, that are in this line of work. Yes. I know there's a lot of stress. I know that there's, you know, a lot of angst and I know some people try and treat that, especially with alcohol, but other substances as well. Um, you know, we need to, you know, have, um, some structure and support for those things. And, uh, you know, peers need to step up and say, Hey, what are you doing fool? You know, uh, alcohol. So it's, it's really not good at any time and trying to, trying to use it to stave off your demons just makes them all the worse. But this, yeah, yeah it's good. It's going to put you directly into a jackpot. It's going to put you directly into a train wreck and you should just expect it. Yeah, because I, I think there's one point where, again, it's it maybe unfortunately the profession does get to you, but I think there has to be that intentional effort to fix what's breaking. Because if you don't make the effort, the whole world around you starts to fall apart. And I, I, I think, again, if I'm trusting you and you're not able to do the job and something happens and let's say, you know, I die, you're going to have to live with that guilt because you knew that you weren't a hundred percent and you still came to work that day. So, um, Hey, by the way, someone mentioned get, uh, with the cowardice and the, uh, and the undo, uh, getting scared, even during an emergent situation isn't abnormal. Uh, some people can't control their fight or flight response. Definitely more forgiveness for that. Getting involved with an inmate. Nah, forget that you're compromised. This is completely controllable situation and no one can trust you after that. So, so it's an interesting, uh, question, a little debatable. It's a little debate. Yeah. Uh, I would I say though, uh, people do, people do have to know what, uh, have to know their limitations. And uh, maybe some people don't know their limitations until they, until they walk into those situations. Um, you know, I think, um, is it a question mark in people's minds? You know, what's going to happen, what's going to happen that first time, um, you know, that, uh, that you have to use force or that you have to defend yourself. Um, and you know, I was like, I was like relieved after my first use of force because it was, it was actually a, it was actually rather kind of a tricky situation. You know, I, um, I was, I was going to try and, uh, there was a, um, a female officer on the tier above me, um, trying to stop two inmates that were fighting. And I went up there to try and help her. And I got caught in the stairwell with a couple guys that wanted to, you know, throw down. And then after that, I was like, oh, cool. I, I, I think that, you know, I have, I know it's not every situation, but from that point forward, I was like, okay, I, I did okay. I did okay. But um, if, if you have such manifest doubts that you, that it's all you can think about or that you suspect that, you know, you just don't have what it takes, you better reassess what you're doing. Because, you know, sometimes, sometimes you might not find out until it's way late in your career. Um, you know, if you're, if you're at a place where there's, you know, not a lot going on or whatever, but, um, you know, that the cowardice is, it, I, you know, I understand that some people don't know and, and, and just can't well, help it. But there's more people, there's more people commenting now saying acts of cowardice. I mean, even if you have a develop again, we're guys, we're, we're not minimizing one over the other, but <laughs> having said that, uh, even develop relationships, I, 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 I believe it's a very intentional effort when you're going out of your way to maintain it. I think there's things that, you know, that inwardly you have to recognize and do something about it. I've had officers that have came up and said, I'm too involved with this inmate and then go ahead and, uh, and basically do the right thing. Did it make him a bad person? No, they caught it ahead of time and they, uh, they weren't worried about their pride or their ego. Cause I had an officer that said, I can't work around females. It's just not for me. And then before something could be, you know, before the person did something foolish, they noticed something in themselves and they said, I got to get out of here. Working with women is, is not for me. And I give respect for that. I think a lot of the times what happens here is, you know, something's going on. You choose not to address it, whether because of pride or ego or, or whatever it may be. And now you're still falling into that same negative behavior. Now it's intentional. It's intentional the moment you know it's happening. And I'm sorry, if you were... If you're seeing this inmate every day, uh, it does become an intentional effort. Uh, but with that said, I think it's the heat of the moment. Cowardice is when I'm at my desperate need for someone to be there for me that could be there for me. And I'm calling and I'm calling and that person 
doesn't come. I will guarantee you after that moment is done, that person who went through that desperate concern, crying for help, being the most vulnerable they could be, yelling for help, will go after that person that was in his position to help them with unforgiveness. I have seen it. I have seen people, a guy gets assaulted by an inmate and becomes more upset with the people that didn't respond than the inmate who assaulted them. I've seen it, Russ. I've seen it because you're, there's an act of desperation and I need you and you fail to do it. Um, ab abusing sick leave, uh, you know, basically, I, I think we're all right now dealing with this concern where I think the thing with, when it comes to sick leave is 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 peer-to-peer -peer accountability. Yes, unfortunately, we have to have posts filled and that's management's job and that's supervisor's jobs. And I get it. And right now we're under and we're trying to do our best with less. But with that said, if we had more also peer-to-peer -peer accountability, you know, you, you're telling me you're going to come in and you come in. You don't call out on Christmas, whatever it is. I think for me, the best facilities that are um, kind of managing the overtime a little bit more effectively is not because management's doing any accountability. It's because the peers are. You want to call out, you're going to see me tomorrow. Just remember that. Yeah. I'm not saying they're going to do anything. You're going to see me tomorrow. So, Russ, what's your thoughts on this abuse? And, and, and regardless, uh, when it comes to abuse and sick leave, FMLA, the reason why that's a problem is because you're 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 breaking the federal uh, – That that's going to wind up being a federal – uh, law that you're violating. And really, this is something where HR can discover if what you have requested is in compliance with the actual leave. So we may be very limited in seeing if it's being misused, but we may see a pattern and the pattern breaks away from your request. You're just FMLA, FMLA, FMLA. And the next thing you know, HR will be able to determine, hey guys, they are in violation. So at this point here, one violation of that Guys, this is no joke. One violation can get you removed because, again, it falls into what? A fraudulent act. What's your thoughts on that, Russ? Yeah, you know, I would say this, you know, uh, show up, uh, do your shift um, and uh, then volunteer for another shift. And, um, you know, I know that people um, I know people who have you know, misused the FMLA. I know that pe I know that some people have. Um, taken advantage of it. They, they, uh, used it, but they didn't really need it because they were, um, you know, they were just more interested in, um, you know, going to a play or the theater or whatever it is. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, uh, creeps up and destroys, uh, morale within, um, the department within the, um, within the facility. So, you know what, um, take what you're, take what you're allowed to take and take no more. Yeah, and Russ, so this is good. We got to definitely have a discussion on this because people are going both ways. They're both equally, and I agree, there's, you know, the consequences could fall, but I just wanted to have the dialogue to see what people, just to have a fun discussion because obviously I'm not minimizing um, the consequences for one or the other, but if you had to choose. Uh, and last one, Russ, is negative contact with outside law enforcement. I mean, that really matters. I mean, uh, anything from being disrespectful to a law enforcement officer to being arrested for something, uh, that really does affect what your credibility and your ability to have that authority. Uh, and what I mean by that is if we give you authority, you also have to be in a position to respect authority. So if you're getting pulled over and you start treating officers like, like garbage, uh, okay, well now I, I, I may have a trouble. I may have trouble trusting you with authority on your, on your own. Uh, or if you're committing to, a, if you commit a crime in which it's criminal uh, that, again, deals with your credibility, deals with your ability to do the job. And therefore, that negative contact with outside law enforcement could be a greater concern. The bigger concern, though, is not reporting the negative contact in a timely manner. A lot of people wait for it to be discovered. And then when they get removed, it's like, I got removed for something as simple as this. No, you got removed because you failed to report it, which goes right back into your credibility. You know, you could have background Honesty. checks. Yeah, honesty. I mean, you could have background checks that are have to be done a certain amount of years and they get done and they discovered it. Oh, yeah, I forgot about it. OK, well, that's a problem. So here's the thing. It's not that you're getting removed for what could be a, a minor violation. Uh, you may be looking at termination because you failed to report it uh, when the incident 
occurred. And they're going to usually carry that. I want people to know something. Sometimes the severity for an officer may be a lot, a lot more than for a civilian, only because the officer is held in a higher level of authority. And therefore, there, there may be some zero tolerance in anything that could be seen uh, that would question their credibility or their integrity. Um, again, because they are the final, they are the final fail safe. Hey, Russ, what's your thoughts on negative contact with outside law enforcement? Uh, yeah, so that just, you know, runs the whole gamut, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, you know, you're stupid and you got a DUI and that leads back to all of the other things that we took. Um, you know, um, it also, you know, leads back to, you know, uh, if you've done, you know, anything else, um, just, um, you know, be professional. Um, when they show up, be professional. If they pull you over, be willing to pay the piper for the dance that you wanted to dance, whatever that was, whether it was speeding or, or anything else, you know, um, accept the consequences, hold yourself accountable. And, uh, and if there's anything there to report, and uh, I mean, if you're in the right, there really shouldn't be, but, you know, go ahead and, and, and report it. Uh, but, you know, uh, the idea that you're um, entitled to get away with something, the idea that, um, that you know, hey, they shouldn't have got me for that, uh, you know, brothers in law enforcement, all that. No, you did the deed, man, step up, man up and yeah. uh, and and just be willing. You know, I was uh, I had um, I had uh, I can't even call it an incident, uh, but, you know. Um, I was, uh, I was going down the road here recently and I was flying, but I was flying to get around this other guy. Cause it was at a horrible place on route 395, you know, and, uh, uh, the chippy, he pulled me over and he said, why are you going so fast? It's dangerous. And I said, look, I know it was dangerous. Uh, I, I said, the only thing that I can say is that I was trying to get around this guy because I felt that that was being more dangerous at the time. And I ended up having to speed beyond what I did. And I'm sorry. And he's like, okay, who'd you work for? And I didn't tell him, you know? And so I ran down a little bit of my history and he says, just take care, you know, but I was willing to take the ticket. I wasn't going to argue with the guy. I wasn't going to make his day worse. I wasn't going to make my day worse, you know, just own, own up to the things that you've, you've done. And the consequences will almost always be less. Yeah. And, and Russ, we definitely, uh, definitely are spot on with that question because uh, I like the other side where one's a reflex, one's a choice. We got to do this on a dialogue, the one with the cowardice and uh, hey, Russ, anything you like to say in closing? Uh, I would just like to say, I hope that uh, everyone out there got something out of this. Um, you know, um, I'm really a big proponent though on, you know, not focusing on what all the negatives are. These are all things that you should obviously avoid. And yet some people aren't obviously going to avoid them. Um, I would really much more focus on, on, you know, what um, your personal professional philosophies are, what your North star is and how you navigate between, uh, you know, all of the, you know, obstacles and dangers that are out there and still, you know, manage to, you know, come through this, um, come through this thing relatively unscathed. I have some nagging injuries, uh, maybe both physical, maybe a few mental, but overall I loved what I did. And, um, I think part of it was, is, you know, because I did have this, you know, philosophy I was, uh, I did everything I could to be, um, you know, to show fidelity, uh, to my oath. And, uh, you know, here I am all these years later and, uh, you know, hoping the best for each of you. Thank you, Russ. And, and, and that's why I always have you on, because as I said, when we have our dialogue, I know it's lessons, but it comes from heart, someone who cares and, and, and wants people to do the right thing, but more importantly, understand why those are the right things. Guys, this is just a quick dialogue. I mean, nothing's exclusive. It's just more of our inclusive, but there's probably other things that could also relate to this topic, but this is meant to be discussion worthy. That's the key. And hope you guys enjoy it, get the best of it, because uh, I'm, I'm hoping to bring about a better understanding of some of the choices that we make at the higher level. As always, guys, the show is Tear Talk. If you haven't, please subscribe, interact, engage, comment, hit that bell. The bell's going to notify you every time I post my video. Stay safe.